All right, so we're today we're going to dive into Bitcoin, but not in the normal and usual way. Actually, we're going to break into possibly an alternative for Bitcoin uh, through an Ethereum EVM. We'll talk all about that today. You guys are going to love it. My name is Paul Barrow. Welcome back into Tech Path. Joining me today is Willem Schro, who's coming over from uh, Botanics Labs. So great to have you. Great to meet you all. Great to meet you, Paul. Hey, Willem. All right, so first let's get into just in general uh, what you guys are trying to do with uh, Botanics. Give me kind of a breakdown. Yeah, um, so uh, Botanics is actually a layer two on Bitcoin, um, but it is fully EVM equivalent. What that means is any of the applications that you see on Ethereum today are now possible on Botanics and are possible on Bitcoin. So with any of the applications, suddenly you will see Bitcoin um, instead of Ethereum. And so we bring right. the whole world of the EVM to Bitcoin and we bring the whole world of and the capital of Bitcoin to the EVM. So why why bring EVM to Bitcoin? What's the, the core behind it? What, what are you guys trying to solve in terms of just the overall technical aspect? Yeah, very good question. Well, it went back like a year where we tried to figure out where is this whole crypto infrastructure going to go to 10 years from now. And very interesting, mm -hmm. we saw like a paradox play out. On the one hand, you have Bitcoin, which is the, the biggest market cap and still considered by many the one and real decentralized reserve currency. Um, and on the other hand, you have Ethereum and the EVM with so many applications built on top of it. And how do you fit these two together? And basically what we saw play out is, um, okay, Bitcoin, almost no applications on top of it. And the EVM, which is what powers Ethereum, is actually where all the applications are built upon. And you can actually take the EVM part um, and put that on top of Bitcoin. And suddenly you can use all the Bitcoin that you have and you can use it in the applications that you find on Ethereum. Okay. All right. Is it a scenario where Bitcoin benefits more or does Ethereum benefit more in this particular scenario? In this scenario, because we are fully uh, on Bitcoin, so the whole protocol will run on Bitcoin. You will use Bitcoin to buy NFTs. You will buy, use Bitcoin to be in DeFi indexes. Um, Bitcoin is here the, the big winner and our applications that we want to bring are really uh, are really to the Bitcoiners. All right, so I was looking at your website and on the how does botanics or botanics work, and it gets into the spider chain. You know, I'm kind of highlighting that on screen right now. But the question I have for you is the difference between the spider chain and what Layer 2 Labs is doing uh, with their BIP sidechain. Because we've had Paul on before talking about, you know, layer, what Layer 2 Labs does and what sidechains do and how they would kind of change the dynamic. What is the difference between what you guys are doing and, the, and, and them? Yeah, so the end goal is actually very similar um, to bring the EVM or other side chains to Bitcoin. However, the approach and the technology is very different. Um, drive chains need a Bitcoin soft fork. Um, so they need an upgrade to the Bitcoin pro protocol while we do not require any soft fork. So the spider chain is actually possible on Bitcoin today, which is a big difference. And so in reality, this is actually a proof of stake. And so the random subset of participants are all stakers. So anyone in the world will be able to run the full protocol. Anyone will be able to stake. And then the decentralized multisigs will basically choose random participants out of that uh, staker set. And so right now we are fully building it. Um, I actually saw the testnet run this week. We will go public uh, with that very soon. And then um, we will start building towards the, the mainnet. Now, one of the things that um, happens when you run a proof of stake on top of Bitcoin, it also means that in the very initial phases, when you have very little Bitcoin staked, you are very vulnerable to an attack basically someone coming in with 5,000 Bitcoin, taking over majority control of the stake and attacking the platform. And that's why we will start off federated in a more centralized way. We will um, be like a liquid basically on uh, Bitcoin, have some federated partners that we work together with until there's sufficient activity in when and we can make the full uh, protocol permissionless. 
All right, I think that's a good step, you know, because you're right with these kinds of things in this kind of scenario, that would make it a little bit of a, a thing at risk. All right, so when you look at both Bitcoin, what we've seen in terms of the core, the core devs on Bitcoin, very reluctant to change over the years. And then you look at the evolution of what's happened within the Ethereum ecosystem, and it's the exact opposite. There's just a constant, you know, throw of new devs. There's a constant uh, new innovation happening, uh, test of all sorts. I mean, when you look at Bitcoin and Ethereum, is Bitcoin ever going to catch up in terms of dev activity and, and real movement to become something of a true currency, or at least the, the, the use case of currency? Because I think that's obviously for Ethereum what, what ETH seems to be trying to achieve. Bitcoin ever going to catch up here? What are your thoughts? Yeah. I think Bitcoin itself, um, as the Bitcoin protocol, I don't think so. Um, it's most important for Bitcoin that it's decentralized and secure. And so that also means not a lot of upgrades. I think for all the layer twos and a lot of applications that are built on top of Bitcoin, absolutely. I think we are um, going to see a very big explosion of applications and layer twos in the coming years. And maybe to, uh, to go further on to that point, um, I actually believe a big, a big portion of the differences between Bitcoin and Ethereum is because of uh, their foundational beliefs, which leads to a culture difference. Like the Bitcoiners, right. they align more with decentralization is the first principle that matters the most. The Ethereum um, uh, proponents um, align more as a first principle. It needs to be composable. It needs to be a virtual machine. And then you have, for right. example, people who like Solana more. They say speed is the other most important. Um, same for Monero and privacy. Now, out of all of these properties, I would say Bitcoin as being the layer one for reserve currency is the most important. But all the other properties who are also very valid and have reached product market fit, you can bring them on top of as a layer on top of Bitcoin as a layer two. And that's what I we think will happen. Yeah, so in terms of the user experience on, on spider chains like this, is this going to be different from other layer twos that would play into this? Yeah, so in terms of user experience, we have optimized for that and we think it's going to be extremely easy to go on to Botanix. Um, okay. For people who have used Arbitrum, Botanix is going to feel like you're bridging from Ethereum to Arbitrum exactly the same. We will provide you with a certain uh, Bitcoin address you send from any wallet, any exchange, any cold wallet, Bitcoin to that address, and boom, you have Bitcoin in your MetaMask. I like it, <laughs> which is, that is so uh, bizarre uh, to see how this is going. As far as timeline, when you look at the current, you know, progress you guys have made so far, what the roadmap looks like. I'll, I'll we'll get to the roadmap in a second, but I'm just kind of curious, just from a framework of timing here, you've got a halvening coming up. There's going to be a lot of acceleration around Bitcoin and its use, along with a lot of people getting into it, just recognizing Bitcoin for the first time. How long before this could potentially be a real solution? Yeah, um, it's very interesting. Development, as long as you're not online and the blockchain is not fully running, can go really fast. Um, so our iteration steps, our testing process are going very fast to the moment we will go out with a test net uh, this month in October. And then after that, we actually are very happy with the timing that the Bitcoin halving is, is coming very soon because we actually aim for the mainnet by the Bitcoin halving. So mainnet basically means you will be able to use it. You will start having all your favorite uh, EVM applications, um, but using Bitcoin with it. Mm -hmm. So explain to me, Willem, uh, how SpiderChain would be different than, say, something like Stacks, you know, building obviously with ordinals playing into this. How, how is it and, and what are the core attributes that would make it different? Yeah, two big differences there. So Stacks runs on the Stacks token, Botanix runs on Bitcoin. And a second big reason, uh, difference is we are fully EVM equivalent, what means that any application that is built on Ethereum is uh, able to be deployed, plug and play, copy paste on top of Botanix. Okay, so we we have a lot of Bitcoiners on our show, uh, people who you know just think it's kind of the only way. And then we have a lot of people 
we're, I would say we're a neutral network. You know, we look at uh, people that are really uh, into Web3 and the development of what's happening in the ETH ecosystem. Obviously, Solana, we talk a lot about that, along with other, you know, projects that are in the layer one, uh, you know, camps, especially if you think about even Cardano and Avalanche. But you look at Bitcoiners and they're very, very centralized into, into the, I should say, the culture, not decentralized, obviously, as a, as a platform, but the culture itself kind of has one vision. Have you had a lot of pushback from Bitcoiners in general? Yeah, more than I expected, actually. And the biggest pushback is actually on the EVM part, even though our whole protocols run on runs on Bitcoin. So I expected a lot of Bitcoiners to actually fully love this. A lot of the pushback has been on the EVM, which is the Ethereum virtual machine. And it is actually because of the connotation and the bias that they have with Ethereum. Um, but we actually argue that the EVM is a hugely powerful virtual machine. And I actually think um, the EVM has won out what we call the virtual machine battle. We think a lot of the applications that we, we've seen have been built on virtual machines and the EVM is the biggest uh, virtual machine uh, out there. Yeah. Is there, in terms of support, where is that coming from for this project? Yeah, very interesting. It's everyone who aligns with our vision that says like, okay, we see Bitcoin is the currency but it's very good at being digital gold and being very decentralized and secure. But then on the other hand, um, they also love the EVM. They also love playing around in DeFi, on DEXs, by NFTs. And so it's basically someone who is active in the, in the application ecosystem, but all, still holds uh, Bitcoin in their cold wallet. And so these two visions, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, you can build the EVM on top of Bitcoin and those are... Um, the people who have seen uh, who we've seen the most support from. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, all right. So uh, we've talked about this, and I think this is one that a lot of people are kind of on the fence about. I, I get people that that think one way, and people that think another way, and that is about Lightning and the use case of Lightning. You know, we've had and we've followed Lightning for many years. Here, we've had many of their dev devs on our show. Where do you think the future of Lightning? And is there a future for Lightning reside, residing today? Oh, I think there is a very big future for Lightning. Lightning solves for fast, free payments. Uh, Botanix solves for um, smart contract applications. And so I think they're very compatible. Like in the future, when you think about fast, free payments, you'll use Lightning. When you think about uh, decentralized stock markets, you'll use Botanix. And so I think you can, in the future, you'll be able to very easily swap from Botanix to Lightning and back. And so I believe Lightning has a very big future ahead of itself. Um, it will take some time. We've seen a lot of development issues, but the more time goes on, the, yeah, the better it will get. Are you following any of this ordinals and runestone uh, scenarios that are starting to play out? Obviously, we've seen you know, ordinals explode this year. Uh, Casey Rodemar, he came back on kind of talking about that he's starting to implementation of runes now named runestone. So it's going to be interesting. Can you explain where and why this would be rolling out? So runestone is, uh, is uh, not connected with Botanix. So I'm following it from the same sidelines as you do. I'm yeah. very happy this is happening. Like I think this will reach massive product market fit. I've actually always said that anything has reached adoption in the rest of crypto will reach adoption on top of Bitcoin. Um, so I think they're like uh, launching these, uh, yeah, these tokens on top of Bitcoin. I'm very looking forward to that. The more activity on Bitcoin, the better. Yeah, interesting stuff. Looking at your roadmap, this is on your website. Uh, you had your Q3 uh, 2023, the test net. So you have a federated EVM sidechain. That's what you were mentioning before. Uh, full EV, EVM equivalents like Polygon, and then um, obviously uh, federated. Talk to me about the uh, the roadmap, what it looks like, not only the rest of this year in Q4, but on into 2024. What's next up for you guys? Yeah, so right now the testnet, it is working uh, privately. Then we'll go to the public on that, and then basically we'll have to build an ecosystem. So we've seen a lot of layer twos launch and there's no activity there. It's a ghost town. 
And so we will have to work together with decentralized exchanges, with DeFi protocols, with NFT marketplaces, and a bunch of other different applications. And then we can basically launch uh, the mainnet. And, and the mainnet is planned, for example, like uh, March, April. The mainnet will also start with a permissioned um, staking protocol. After that, as the protocol grows, we can become fully permissionless. And that's really the end goal that anyone can be able to join the protocol, uh, stake and run a full node. Why hasn't this been done before? What, what do you think has been the holdback? I mean, because the technology has been there. Why, why not now or why now, I guess I should say, why hasn't this been done before? That is a very good question. Um, I think it's unique over the last two years, we have seen Taproot come out. This wasn't possible before Taproot. Uh, we've seen bigger multisig sizes come out. And then really the, uh, yeah, the game changer is the spider chain. Uh, yeah. So suddenly we came, we came up with a design that are bigger multisig sizes and you split it up in a lot of different small multisig sizes. And suddenly you can build a protocol that doesn't need any soft fork. Um, we also optimized because we wanted to bring the EVM to Bitcoin, which immediately puts you in a very small box. If you don't want any soft forks and you want the EVM, then basically your design space becomes uh, very limited. And they basically that pushed us to the design of the spider chain that we have today. Um, mm -hmm. And why it hasn't been done before is, uh, I guess, uh, that's how time goes. <laughs> well, Willem, I'm I'm uh, going to be watching very very closely as you guys develop because this will be an interesting development, I think, for Bitcoin, especially to get into an EVM layer. Um, but we do thank you so much for uh, stopping in today. We appreciate it. Absolutely, thank you, uh, Paul. You bet. All right, so you guys are tuned in. Sometimes we do breakdowns like this where we'll get into project owners, founders, etc. Uh, make sure and jump over here to the YouTube channel if you're picking this up on the podcast side. Uh, you can subscribe to the channel. Uh, hit that little bell. You get notifications when we do live streams, all that kind of stuff. And if you're not part of our Diamond Circle, make sure and get in involved in on that. We have a Web3 podcast along with some additional content and research that we drop over there. And if you guys want to reach me out there on X, it's at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.